Okay, so this is our last in-person lecture, and then starting next week, they'll be in teams, so I'm going to be working on getting that figured out tomorrow. So look for those invitations or links coming. Uh, they will also get recorded so that people who can't attend during normal class time will still have access to them. All right, so today we have just one day to talk about the endocrine system. You could talk about the endocrine system for months, but we have one day. So I tried to think about what are going to be the most interesting and useful things for you to hear about. So first of all, let's just be clear about what we're talking about. Oh, it's going to be hard to not walk around. Okay, so what is the endocrine system? It's a communication system in our body that uses chemicals chemical molecules as messengers, right? So we have different molecules of different types that are hormones that serve for as a mechanism for one part of the body to communicate with another part of the body. Well, if you would rather sit somewhere where it's easier to see the screen, you're welcome to, but you don't have to. <laughs> okay. I know, have it, right? So here you can see a couple of different hormones, so cortisol, estradiol, testosterone. You can see that those look structurally very similar from a chemical standpoint. They are steroid hormones. You might remember when we learned about lipids, one of the subtypes of lipids was steroids that are made of those carbon rings. Thyroxin or thyroid hormone is on there, but there are lots of other chemicals that float through our bloodstream to serve as messengers. So hormones are chemical messengers. They are made by glands, G-L-A-N-D-S, and we have lots of glands all over our body. So some are located up in the brain, like the hypothalamus, the pituitary, and the pineal gland. The thyroid gland is here in the neck, and the parathyroid glands are behind it. The thymus is a gland that's active in infancy, but in most of us is pretty much done. Then we have the adrenal glands, which make adrenaline. Our kidneys make some hormones. Our pancreas makes some hormones. And of course, our ovaries or testicles also make hormones. So we have lots of different glands in the body. We're only gonna talk about a few of these because we just have one day. All right, and sometimes even individual cells can produce hormones. So most of them are produced by glands, but sometimes by individual cells as well. The key thing about hormones is that most of them, most of these chemical messengers travel through the bloodstream. So they're made by the cells in these glands that secrete them into the bloodstream. And of course, once you're in the bloodstream, you're gonna go through the whole circulatory system. Right, So you get secreted into a capillary, you travel through a vein, all the way up to the right side of the heart, out to the lungs, into the left side of the heart, out to the rest of the body. Right, So you get mixed in with all the general blood. So hormones are everywhere. Right, So any hormone that gets secreted into our bloodstream is everywhere in our body. But of course, it's not acting on all of the cells in our body necessarily. So it travels through the bloodstream. The, it's going to determine whether it actually has an effect on a certain cell type or not is whether that cell has a receptor specifically for that hormone. So we've learned about receptors before. Remember, they're usually protein molecules in the plasma membrane of a cell sitting on the and they are very specific to different types of molecules. So we've talked about receptors in the synapse, right? Like in the neuromuscular junction, you have to have a receptor for acetylcholine in order for the muscle cell to receive that signal. Same kind of thing here. You need to have the right receptor. So you can see in this example, right, one of these cells is a target cell and it has the receptor that is specific to that hormone. So it will be able to receive the message that that hormone is conveying, but a cell that doesn't have those receptors will not effectively, quote, see the hormone, right? So that's why even though the hormone is everywhere in the body, not every single organ or cell type is actually responding to it. Only those who have the specific receptors. All right, so the interesting thing about the endocrine system is it's not the only communication system that we've talked about, right? So we've also talked about the nervous system. So the nervous system, of course, uses action potentials, which are electrical signals. They travel very, very rapidly down the axons of the neurons, right, in nerves. And so it's immediate. 
but short acting. The endocrine system, however, this takes some time. So it's a little bit slower in onset, but it's longer lasting. I kind of think about it as if the nervous system is, you know, like telephone lines or something, right? Um, back in the old days when <laughs> things were traveled along actual cables, right? So, you know, it's immediate, it's right away, it's quick, but it's short acting. Whereas the endocrine system, you're secreting these hormones, these chemical messengers into the bloodstream, and they're going to float around for a while, right? They're going to hang around for a while. So it's a little slower in onset, but longer lasting. So it's kind of nice. We have two different, two different ways to communicate from one part of the body from the other. Okay. So whenever we're talking about the endocrine system, the hormonal system, we have to give a special nod to the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus is part of the brain, and it serves as a link between our nervous system and our endocrine system. So it's technically part of the brain, so it has nervous tissue in it, but it also can produce some hormones, particularly regulatory type hormones. So it's also part of the endocrine system. It's this really interesting hybrid. And the hypothalamus is going to work in concert, so together with the pituitary gland, which is located right near it in the brain. So you can kind of see in that blue image there, you see the pituitary gland is located right underneath the hypothalamus. So those two are going to work hand in hand quite often. All right, so this is kind of general information about the endocrine system. Now we're going to kind of zero in on a specific gland and hormone to kind of show you how some of this works. So first we're going to talk about the thyroid gland and the thyroid hormone. Okay. All right. So thyroid hormone, also called thyroxin, so you'll see that word, um, sometimes also called T3 and T4, so you may see it under various different names. But it's a hormone produced by the thyroid gland, which is kind of like a little bow tie on either side of your trachea here in the neck. And basically what the thyroid gland does is it kind of sets the overall metabolic rate for your body. Okay, It kind of sets the energy level, the activity level for all of the chemical reactions that are going to happen in your body. So it's really important for setting your metabolism. So the way we control this is that the hypothalamus is in charge. So we're going to find that a lot. The hypothalamus is kind of the boss of much of the, immune, of the endocrine system. So what the hypothalamus does is it surveys the scene and it looks at how much thyroid hormone is in the bloodstream. If thyroid hormone levels are low, then the hypothalamus, the boss says, we need to kick it into gear. And so he's going to signal the pituitary gland to make and secrete a hormone called TSH, which stands for thyroid stimulating hormone. So, but you can guess what it's gonna do. So TSH then tells the thyroid gland to make more thyroid hormone. So it's this kind of complicated system, right? So you have the boss, the hypothalamus, that tells his right-hand man, the pituitary, to create a message, a chemical message, a hormone, TSH, to tell the thyroid gland, right, the guy down on the factory floor, to make more thyroid hormone. So we have this kind of sequence of events. And so when the thyroid sees that increased level of TSH, right, in the bloodstream, then it will increase its production of thyroid hormone. It's pretty sweet. <laughs> All right. If the thyroid hormone level starts getting too high, the hypothalamus is going to see that and say, oh, we need to shut this down. Okay, so it's going to stop signaling the pituitary gland. The pituitary gland will then stop making TSH, and then the thyroid gland is going to kind of take a vacation day and stop making thyroid hormone, and then the hormone level will gradually drift back into the normal range. So if this is sounding a little bit familiar, might be because this is a negative feedback mechanism, right? So this is just like a thermostat, 
right? If the temperature in your house gets too low, your thermostat senses that and it sends a signal to the furnace to kick on. The furnace starts generating heat until the temperature comes up and then the thermostat shuts the system off. Same type of thing. The thermostat in this example is the hypothalamus and the pituitary working together. And then the furnace would be like your thyroid gland making the thyroid hormone. Okay. So pretty good. As you might remember, negative feedback systems are really useful for maintaining homeostasis, keeping things within a fairly relatively narrow range, right? We want to keep things pretty much the same. Uh, just enough and not too much. All right, so let's talk about a case. So Tessa has been feeling really run down and fatigued. And she feels cold all the time. She has dry skin and she's really constipated, right? So her doctor orders a, quote, thyroid test, and this is the result. I'm not sure if you can see in the image, but the red value here is TSH, and it is designated as high, at 6.54, normal is anywhere from 0 0.27 to 4.2. Okay, so her TSH level is high. The doctor says she has an underactive thyroid, but she's confused because the test result says that it's high, right? So how could that be a low thyroid, right? So let's kind of take a look at it, right? What's going on, right? If TSH is high, that means the hypothalamus is sensing there's not enough thyroid hormone around. It's sending the signal to the pituitary, and the pituitary is making TSH, right? So TSH is the signal to the thyroid gland to come on, make more hormone. And we only produce that if the thyroid gland is not making enough hormone, right? So you just have to be careful because it doesn't seem intuitive, right? The thyroid test value is high, but that's because what we're testing for is that signal, that stimulus to the thyroid gland to get busy and to make more hormone levels. Does that make sense? Okay, all right. <laughs> all right, so let's talk about another example. So Tim also is not feeling great. <laughs> Doctor tests his thyroid levels and says everything's normal, but Tim has read some online blogs about thyroid supplements and that they can give you more energy and help you get more work done. So he starts taking them. Why not, right? <laughs> he starts to feel really kind of jittery and on edge. He gets kind of sweaty. He has trouble sleeping and he starts losing weight. Right? So he goes back to his doctor who says, hmm. <laughs> I think your symptoms might be from too much thyroid hormone, right? Because he's taking these supplements. So he orders a blood test. So what are we going to expect the TSH level to be in this case? Yeah, good. It's going to be really low, right? Because the hypothalamus is like, whoa, like shut her down. And so the pituitary is not making any TSH, right? Because we're like, there is too much thyroid hormone around, so we're not going to stimulate the thyroid gland to make more. So the TSH, which is that stimulating hormone to the thyroid gland, will actually be low. Perfect. All right. So... One of the reasons I wanted to include this example is because an underactive or hypoactive thyroid gland is a pretty common medical condition, relatively speaking. You can also have an overactive or a hyperactive thyroid gland. That's a little less common. Um, and it's kind of this, it's, it's, that not, it's, it's not obvious, you know, when you get that test result, right? But if you understand the physiology, what's happening behind the scenes, then you're like, oh, that's why a high thyroid test means your thyroid function is actually low, okay? All right. Questions about thyroid before we move on? Yeah. Ah, so Graves' disease is a disease that causes increased action of the thyroid gland and increased production of thyroid hormone. And it's fascinating why that happens. <laughs> and it seems to be an autoimmune disease where your body makes antibodies against the thyroid gland that act like TSH. 
So you're accidentally telling your thyroid gland to make more thyroid hormone. Mm hmm Pretty crazy. Yeah. Okay, kind of a weird question, but um, so is there any like PSA scene coffee where people like get all like Ah, it's a really good question. So is there a TSH in coffee? Why do people get jittery if they drink a lot of caffeine? And caffeine actually directly stimulates your nervous system. <laughs> so it's a completely different scenario, but can result in a lot of the same symptoms. <laughs> yes, <laughs> good one. Other questions about thyroid? So many things can make us feel really tired and so many things can make us feel wired. All right, tired or wired, human condition. All right. So we're going to move on and we're going to talk about insulin and glucagon. They are kind of the yin and the yang of glucose regulation or blood sugar regulation. They are foes. They act opposite to each other. So both of these hormones are important in regulation of blood glucose levels. So if you've ever heard somebody talk about being hypoglycemic, that is low blood sugar or low blood glucose levels. Hyperglycemic is high blood sugar or high blood glucose levels. All right. But we don't want it to be too high and we don't want it to be too low. We want it to be just right. We want to maintain homeostasis. Why? If it's too low, then we're not going to get enough glucose moving via diffusion facilitated diffusion, you might remember, from the bloodstream into the cells. And if the cells can't get enough glucose, then they can't do enough aerobic cellular respiration. They can't make enough ATP, which is their source of energy that allows them to survive. So if your cells can't make enough ATP, they start to malfunction. And if it's severe and ongoing enough, the cell will actually die. Okay, so you need to have enough glucose. You might say, well, why not have tons of glucose? Then my cells would have all the energy they could possibly need. Alas, having too much glucose is also a problem. If it's too high, you might remember from way back when we did the urinary system, your nephron loses the ability to reabsorb it all out of the, out of the filtrate and back into the blood and you start losing glucose in your urine. So you're losing an important nutrient. Also, if your blood glucose levels are high, over time, that causes your blood vessels to get really brittle. And the reason why that happens is because imagine, for example, you are working in a carpentry shop. And as part of your woodworking project, you are sanding the wood. And let's say that you don't have one of those fancy vacuum attachments that sucks up all the sawdust. So a lot of sawdust gets out into the air. And let's say then you go to paint something. Well, some of that sawdust is going to land and get incorporated into the paint, right? So you're not going to have as nice smooth finish on that paint as you would otherwise. You know, that was like a really long meandering analogy, right? But the same kind of thing happens if there's a lot of extra glucose molecules in our bloodstream. Those glucose molecules get incorporated into the walls of our blood vessels, and they are brittle. They are not resilient. They are not flexible. And that, over time, causes damage to the blood vessels, which leads to atherosclerosis which we talked about when we did the cardiovascular system. So it increases your risk for heart attacks and stroke and kidney disease. So we don't want that. Also, if your blood glucose is too high, it also impairs the functioning of the immune system. So we also don't want that. So we want it just right. We have two hormones that I've already mentioned. Now, both of them are made by the pancreas. And that might seem a little weird. Right, because wait, the pancreas was part of the digestive system. Yes, and the pancreas is part of the endocrine system. So the pancreas is very multi-talented, right? A total renaissance man. So it has this exocrine function where it makes digestive enzymes that it secretes into the duodenum, the first part of the small intestine, to help us digest food molecules. But it also has an endocrine function where it secretes hormones into the bloodstream. So I think you can see in this image, 
Here in the kind of the blue, they're talking about the digestive enzymes that are made and squirted into the intestine. But over here in the purple, they're talking about the endocrine function of the pancreas, where it secretes hormones into the bloodstream. So the pancreas is doing two entirely different types of things all at the same time. Yeah. This part? I don't know. It's called the uncinate process. It has a special name, but why? I have no idea. Okay. <laughs> It just makes it kind of cute. I don't know. <laughs> yep. Pancreas is this very strange organ. And marvelous. Okay. All right. So the two hormones that we're going to find made by the pancreas are insulin and glucagon. Insulin is going to decrease blood glucose. Glucagon is going to increase blood glucose. Right? So they're going to be constantly fighting each other. All right, let's take a deeper look at those. So insulin. I already said, made by the pancreas, it gets secreted into the bloodstream. What insulin does when it travels out into the body is it stimulates cells to take glucose in. So you might remember glucose is not a huge molecule, but it's big enough and it's polar, so it can't go by simple diffusion across the cell membrane. It goes via facilitated diffusion with a protein channel. And insulin helps open up that protein channel so that glucose can actually enter the cells. So you have more cells slurping up glucose from the bloodstream and taking it inside the cell. So that's gonna reduce blood glucose concentrations. And with the liver cells specifically, it not only tells them to take in the glucose, but it also stimulates them to turn it into glycogen, which you might remember from our digestive system unit is the storage form of glucose, right? When there's extra glucose around, we package it up into glycogen, like storing it in the pantry for when we need it later, okay? When people carb load, they're maximizing glycogen storage. So insulin is going to tell all of the cells to take in more glucose and it's going to tell the liver to take in more glucose and turn it into glycogen. And because the cells are basically eating up more glucose from the bloodstream, the amount of glucose in the bloodstream will go down and the level will go back to normal. So when would we make insulin? Well, when our blood glucose level goes up. When does our blood glucose level go up? Yeah, absolutely, when we eat, right? So here we go, we eat some Fruit Loops. Delicious, right? Very high in simple carbohydrates, right? So especially if you eat a meal that has a lot of carbohydrates, especially simple carbohydrates, your blood glucose level is going to go up because it does not take very long, right, for that to get broken down into glucose in your digestive system, absorbed across the wall of your intestines into your bloodstream, right? So when that happens, then your pancreas is going to sense that glucose levels are high and it's going to make insulin. Insulin gets secreted into the bloodstream. Blood is going to carry both the glucose, which is in it, and the insulin, which is now in it, all over the entire body. Insulin, as they say here, acts like a key to open the cells, right? So it helps open that channel so that glucose can move inside of the cells, right? And as the cells then are able to absorb the glucose from the bloodstream, because it's opened up those channels, then the glucose levels in the bloodstream will fall. Okay. So if there weren't like concerns about biosafety and everything, I would have like had us like check our blood sugar today and then drink a whole bunch of grape juice and then check it again and then check it again 30 minutes after. Because what you would find is that right after having something really sugary, your blood glucose goes up, but then your pancreas secretes insulin and the glucose gets moved into your cells. And so your blood glucose level comes back to normal. Right? So that's constantly happening. That's one of the reasons why eating a lot of sugary foods in general is not that great for you. Because <laughs> you get those huge increases in glucose. Right, A more gradual increase in blood glucose is better tolerated and responded to by the body. Right? So that's when we say avoid lots of simple sugars. That is why. All right, questions about the insulin part. Yeah. Uh, so this is maybe a little specific, but I have PCOS. Yes. Which means I have 
I don't have diabetes, but I have insulin resistance. You do. We'll talk about that. Hold on to it. <laughs> yep. <laughs> All right. So we'll talk about insulin's evil twin, glucagon, right? And you would think with a name like glucagon that it would mean glucose would be gone, that it would get rid of glucose. But no, it's insulin that lowers blood glucose levels. Glucagon actually will increase blood glucose levels, right? So how is it going to do that? Well, it's going to... You can't really tell cells to like take in less glucose than they already do. So what it's going to do is it's going to tell the liver cells to take some of that glycogen, break it down into glucose, and release that glucose into the bloodstream. It will also tell our adipose tissue, our fat tissue in our body, to start breaking down lipid into fatty acids and secreting that into the bloodstream as well because we can use fatty acids, you might remember, for aerobic cellular respiration if we have to, okay? So if glucose levels are low, glucagon will be secreted and it will activate the liver and the adipose tissue to release energy sources into the bloodstream. So the liver is gonna break down glycogen into glucose and release that. And our fat tissue will also break down their into fat into fatty acids, so we can use those too. Additionally, the liver is also able to do some pretty fancy stuff called gluconeogenesis, where it will actually, the liver can take fatty acids and proteins and turn those into glucose. It doesn't like to do that, but it can. All right. So glucagon will, of course, then, that's something we're going to secrete if glucose levels are low. So in between meals, right, glucose levels are low. You know, sometimes you wake up in the morning and you're doing your thing and then you just kind of feel like, oh, right? If you haven't eaten, had anything to eat or drink yet, <laughs> this glucagon is like, oh, we need to get some more glucose into this bloodstream. And when you exercise, that can increase your glucagon because you are using up your glucose much more rapidly. So glucose levels will fall when you exercise. We don't normally perceive that because our glucagon is on it and telling the liver to go ahead and break down that glycogen for us. So together, right, these two hormones are gonna maintain glucose homeostasis. So let me just kind of break down this diagram for you. So in the top part, if glucose levels increase, right, such as after eating, right, so then we get hyperglycemic, our blood sugar level gets high. The pancreas is going to release insulin, which travels through the bloodstream, tells the cells to take up more glucose, tells the liver to take up more glucose and store it away as glycogen. That's going to cause plasma glucose levels to get back down to normal. If our plasma glucose levels decrease, we're hypoglycemic, our pancreas is instead going to make glucagon, and that will tell the liver to break down glycogen into glucose and secrete it out into the bloodstream so that our glucose levels come back up to normal. Okay. So these two opposing hormones help keep everything in balance for us. Okay. Questions about that much? All right, this is just another diagram that kind of shows the same thing. Maybe it speaks to you more. Okay, so what's diabetes then, right? So I wanted to make sure to talk about this today because diabetes is really common. So you probably know someone who has it or someone who's at increased risk for it. Um, many of us will develop it at some time in our lives. So it's a really important thing to know about. So basically, diabetes is a condition where your blood glucose levels are too high, right? And it's always due to either not having enough of or not having fully functional, having ineffective insulin, okay? So it's always going to have to do with insulin. And the name diabetes, diabetes refers to a condition actually where you're peeing a lot and mellitus comes from the Greek and it means sweet because it used to be they would diagnose this by tasting your urine. And people who have diabetes are spilling glucose into their urine and their urine tastes sweet. So I'm so glad I'm a doctor in this day and age where I do not have to taste my patient's urine in order to diagnose this problem. 
All right. So our two types. Type 1, which is often thought of as juvenile or childhood onset diabetes, is where the pancreas can't make insulin. So people with type 1 diabetes cannot make insulin. It's due to an autoimmune disorder where their immune system ends up attacking the cells in the pancreas that make insulin and killing them. All right, so this often starts in childhood. So, you know, I have, gosh, I know three children under the age of 15 who have this, who are friends here in the community, right? But sometimes it can happen later in life, but it usually happens in childhood. Type 2 diabetes is where you have plenty of insulin, but it's not as efficacious as it should be. It's not working as it should be. And so this is often referred to as insulin resistant, which is kind of a spectrum in terms of severity, right? And so the insulin is there, but it's not able to do its job properly, okay? And so in both of these conditions, without insulin to help bring your blood glucose levels down by getting it into the cells, having the cells suck more of it into themselves, right, you're going to have too much glucose in the bloodstream. So here's our case. So we'll talk about Susie. She hasn't been feeling well either. She feels really tired and worn out. Didn't I say there's a lot of things that can cause people to feel tired, right? But she's also been really hungry, and she's been eating more but losing weight. And she's really thirsty, and she's peeing a lot. So this is actually the classic description of somebody with diabetes. So she goes to get tested, and in her urine, there is glucose present. That should not normally be there. Glucose should be nearly 100% reabsorbed from the filtrate in the nephron. We shouldn't be peeing out glucose, and her blood glucose level is too high, right? So she gets diagnosed with diabetes. And so we've already talked about the two types, and I'm just going to reiterate again why this is problematic to have high blood sugar, okay? So, first of all, all our body cells need glucose, right? So we can't let it get too low. But in terms of too high, several things happen. So one we already talked about. We overwhelm those carrier proteins in the nephron. You can't reabsorb it. So leucine ethylene chocolate factory, totally overwhelmed. Can't pull all that glucose back into the bloodstream. And so then you're wasting precious glucose. This is a nutrient that you need to turn into energy. Right? This is why she's losing weight. She is peeing out her calories. Right? Despite the fact that she's eating more, she's peeing out so many calories that she is losing weight. Glucose that stays in the urine then is osmotically active. It pulls water with it because there's such a high concentration of glucose in the urine. And so what that happens is that you lose a lot of body water, you have to pee more, you get really thirsty, right? And then this can throw off all kinds of things with your blood chemistry. So that's a problem. And then, as I mentioned before, too much glucose makes blood vessels brittle over time and causes, over time, the increased risk for heart attack, stroke, kidney damage, and eye problems that we see with people who have diabetes. So we need to do something about it. All right, and the immune system doesn't function properly. All right, so treatments for type 2 diabetes, interestingly, exercise can be really effective because exercise can increase our cells' sensitivity to insulin. So remember, with type 2 diabetes, it's insulin resistant. It's like the cells can't really see the insulin well. They're resistant to it. They don't respond to it as eagerly as they should. So exercise in and of itself can increase the cell's sensitivity to insulin and help combat that insulin resistance. For some people with type 2 diabetes, a regular exercise program can be enough to shift them back into normal physiology. Healthy food. 
So avoiding foods that cause those big spikes in blood sugar. So people who have type 2 diabetes, we ask them to be really careful about fruit juice and cakes and candy and anything that's a simple carbohydrate because that's going to cause a rapid spike in blood glucose. And then if those two things together aren't successful in controlling the diabetes and keeping their blood sugar at normal levels, then we're going to use medications. And we have lots of different medications that work in lots of different ways to help treat type 2 diabetes. And very occasionally in some people, despite all our medications, sometimes we still can't get it under control. Very occasionally for type 2 diabetes, we will also have them take insulin. Yeah. Is there this, if for some reason, like maybe they have to take Gatorade, could they just drink that over a long period of time without causing massive spike in blood sugar? Sure, yeah. Yep. If you drink it over a longer period of time or if you combine it with other foods, right, that'll slow the release of glucose into the bloodstream. Mm -hmm. All right. So what about type 1? So the interesting thing about insulin is it doesn't just stimulate the cells to take up more glucose. Insulin is actually necessary in order for most cells in our body, the one exception is cells in our brain. Without insulin, most of the cells in our body cannot take glucose from the bloodstream at all. So this is not usually a problem for people with type 2 because they have insulin around, right? It's just not particularly good at doing its job. It's doing its job passively well, however, right? But people with type 1 diabetes, if you have no insulin, then your cells can't get any glucose whatsoever. They will start to starve. And they will start breaking down protein and fat to use for energy instead. What happens when you do that is you create acidic waste products called ketones. So it is inefficient. It's an inefficient use of calories. You don't get a lot of energy for it. And it generates these waste products called ketones. And that can cause a life-threatening condition called diabetic ketoacidosis. Okay. Yeah. So with the keto diet, why is this like, so promoted Right, so the way a keto diet works is you don't eat any carbs, right? So your body has no choice but to use proteins and fats and break those down for energy. And that's a much less efficient conversion. It's very wasteful. So of all the calories that you eat, you are not getting all those calories, right? Kind of pound for pound or whatever. So a keto diet, you're, you're forcing your body to use a less efficient, kind of more wasteful form of fuel, right? It's like driving a car with like a hole punctured in the fuel tank, right? A lot of the fuel is just draining out, right? So you'll lose weight on a keto diet if you can maintain it long term, which most people can't because you feel pretty yucky. But you won't get ketoacidosis because you still have insulin, so when your liver turns fats and uh, proteins into glucose, you can still use that. So people on a keto diet do make ketones, and they do get a little bit acidic, but not anywhere to the same extent as somebody with type 1 diabetes who's not on treatment. So diabetic ketoacidosis usually only happens in people with type 1, usually only happens if you completely don't have insulin. And it can cause coma and death if it's not treated. This is a real medical emergency. These folks often end up in the ICU. And what happens is their blood pH, because of these acidic waste products, these ketones, their blood gets too acidic. So the member of pH gets low. So normal blood pH for humans is around 7.4. So it's going to get less than that. And what we'll see when a patient comes in with this is that their respiratory system will be trying to compensate, will be trying to get rid of excess acid by <sighs> blowing off as much carbon dioxide as possible. Because remember, carbon dioxide is acidic. So I'm going to show you this video clip, which you've seen a similar one before. 
Okay, so for type 1, since the problem is that they can't produce insulin, the treatment is to give them insulin. We will also give them lots of fluids because they're usually really dehydrated. And once they have insulin in hand, then they can get that blood glucose down. Glucose can get into the cells. Cells can use that for production of ATP. And then they will stop producing more of these ketones, right? And then the blood pH will normalize. So the treatment for type 1, whether it's diabetic ketoacidosis or just in general, somebody who has type 1, since the problem is that they can't make insulin, we have to give it to them. Insulin is a peptide hormone, which, which means it's made of a string of amino acids. It's kind of like a mini protein. So you can't take it as a pill because you have digestive enzymes to break apart peptides, right? So you would break it into its constituent amino acids. So we can't give it as a pill. So we give it either as injections, you know, the needle, or a pump that is constantly infusing under the skin into their body. Okay. And it's pretty amazing because it used to be that type 1 diabetes was always fatal. In fact, um, oh, I don't know if you know much about the history of Menominee. But the Wilson family was one of the big lumber baron families, and they actually lost a daughter to type 1 diabetes because in the early 1900s, nobody knew insulin was a thing. Nobody knew what was wrong with these children until Banting and Best, who were these two scientists, and that's their dog. They harvested pancreatic cells from their dog, and they figured out that pancreatic extract could treat type 1 diabetes. And this was really revolutionary at the time. Because remember, we talked about symptoms of diabetes, weight loss, right? Think how much weight loss if you cannot get any glucose, right? You're constantly peeing out all your glucose. No insulin, right? So these children basically used to starve to death. They rarely made it past their teenage years depending on how long they'd had the disease. Usual time from diagnosis to death was less than two years. Okay? But <laughs> give them some pancreatic extract, insulin, right? problem solved. So this is kind of one of the biggest breakthroughs in medicine in terms of like our ability to, to um, save these children. And it's interesting, the story of the Wilson family um, so their daughter died two years before insulin was discovered. You know, so it's like, ah, oh, so close. So close. All right. So if you have type 1, the problem is you don't have insulin, so the treatment is we're going to give you insulin. And if you have type 2, we need to do things to help the cells be less resistant to insulin. We need to help them more sensitive to insulin, help them respond to it better. So there are dietary changes, exercise, and medications. And then sometimes, then we just have to give people additional insulin on top of that. Mm -hmm. Right, so is it possible to have too much insulin in your bloodstream? Yes. So what we find in people with type 2 diabetes is that they tend to have high insulin levels, right? Because it's not working as well, so you need more of it to try to, like, you know, it's like knocking on the door, you know, softly isn't enough, you gotta knock harder on the door, right? So we don't like to then have to just give additional insulin because in high insulin levels itself can cause some problems down the road, but um, it's the lesser of two evils, yeah. Good question. Other questions about diabetes? Uh, so gestational diabetes is diabetes that occurs during pregnancy. And there's all kinds of crazy hormonal and metabolic things that happen during pregnancy. And so some people actually develop diabetes specifically just during pregnancy. You're at increased risk if you're older or if diabetes runs in your family, specifically type 2, um, or if you have a condition that otherwise increases your risk for diabetes. Um, and, and they have to be treated with insulin. It's really interesting. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and so it's one of the things that we test for, you know, at those regular, you know, OBGYN visits in pregnant people. It's one of the things that they check for, you know, before you get about halfway through the pregnancy, they check for gestational diabetes. Absolutely, yeah. 
Other questions? All right, so we're going to finish our discussion of the endocrine system by talking about the reproductive hormones. That's going to kind of segue us into the reproductive system, which is next week's topic. So who are the players? So again, the hypothalamus is going to be the boss in this situation, right, up there in the brain. And the pituitary, don't worry about the fact that I say anterior pituitary, just know the pituitary is kind of the go-between, kind of the right-hand man. And then the workers, our factory line producers here, are the gonads. Gonad is a nonspecific word that refers to what are either the testicles or the testes, sometimes they're also called, or the ovaries. Okay? So gonad is just the way to say testicles or ovaries, whichever ones you have. Okay? So those are the actors in this play. So hypothalamus, pituitary, and the gonads. Oh, there, oh, yeah, there's the gonads. Okay. So what are the goals of the reproductive system? So the reproductive system wants to do two things. One is we want to have the appropriate levels of sex hormones in our bloodstream. So that's going to allow for sexual function. So we want to have enough of our sex hormones in the bloodstream. So for male-bodied people, that's testosterone is their sex hormone. And for female-bodied people, it's estrogen and progesterone, primarily. Okay, so we want to have enough sex hormone production by the gonads. The gonads are what produce the sex hormones. The gonads are also what produce the sex cells, which are also called gametes. So gamete is the nonspecific term for what is either a sperm in a male-bodied person or an oocyte or egg in a female-bodied person. So the two jobs of the gonads are to make sex hormones and to make gametes, right? So for proper reproductive function, you need those two things. So let's take a look. Sorry, this is way too much text on the slide. <laughs> All right, so the hypothalamus is the boss. In male-bodied people, the hypothalamus is pretty much just looking to see if there's enough testosterone in the bloodstream or not, okay? Kind of like the hypothalamus looks to see if there's enough thyroid hormone in the bloodstream or not. In female-bodied people, it looks at that, and it also thinks about, because it's part of the nervous system, whether now is a good time to get pregnant or not. So it's going to check in with the nervous system, and if we've had some weight loss recently, then our hypothalamus is going to be worried there's a famine going on, not a good time to try to get pregnant and have a baby. If we're really stressed, if we're exercising too much, if we have an eating disorder, or if we're medically ill, any of those things can make the hypothalamus think, hmm, now is not a good time to get pregnant, right? So the hypothalamus in males and females, I should change the slide, is looking to see if there's enough sex hormone and looking to see if it's a good time to try to reproduce or not. So if it's like, hmm, we need a little bit more hormone or yes, let's try to get pregnant, it's going to make a hormone called GnRH. So the hypothalamus makes GnRH. GnRH goes to the pituitary. It's like passing a note to the pituitary gland. GnRH is the note, it's the memo, it's the email that the boss sends saying, I need you to do something. And the pituitary is then in response gonna make two hormones, LH and FSH. Those two hormones, which are together called the gonadotropins, and if you break that word down, gonadotropin, gonad goes to the gonads. Tropin means it's trophic or goes toward. So those are the hormones that are going to travel through the bloodstream to the gonads. FSH, you don't need to know what it stands for, although it's written out here. FSH is going to tell the gonads to make gametes, sperm, or egg. And LH is going to tell the gonads to make horm sex hormones, so testosterone or primarily estrogen. 
So again, we have this kind of multi-layered this to this to this to this, right? Multiple steps in this sequence. Okay. And so, right? So these sex hormones that are produced make all kinds of things happen, right? So the interesting thing is that when we are children, the hypothalamus wants sex hormone levels to be low. It's like turning the thermostat way down when you're not going to be home for a while, okay? It's like, no, it's not the time. When you enter puberty, the hypothalamus turns the thermostat up. The hypothalamus says, okay, now we need to ramp up production. So if you check hormone levels in children of testosterone and estrogen, they're very low, right? So what happens at puberty is hypothalamus starts making GnRH. That tells the pituitary to make LH and FSH, and that tells the gonads to start making hormones and gametes, right? which is also why we don't produce any actual gametes until puberty, right? So you can't get pregnant or get somebody else pregnant if you haven't gone through puberty yet, okay? All right, so, and then puberty itself, right? Not only are you making gametes, but there's all kinds of other things ha that happen in the body. You don't need to know all of these. I just want you to just kind of think about all the physical changes that happen as a result of our sex hormones, right? So body hair increases in both biologic sexes, right? So pubic hair, axillary hair, right? You get hair in your armpit. And if, you're, if you have testosterone, you also get facial hair, right? If it's in your genetic heritage to have facial hair. Skin, right? Oh, we start to get stinky, <laughs> right? Our skin gets oilier, all those fun things happen. And if you have testosterone as your sex hormone, the skin also starts to thicken and get a bit coarser in texture. In terms of the skeleton, right, this is actually going to cause growth, right? So linear growth in terms of making you taller. So you know how female-bodied people often enter puberty earlier than male-bodied people? So sometimes it's like fifth and sixth grade that the girls start developing and they get taller, right? So like the seventh grade dance, the girls are all taller than the boys, right? Because they haven't gone through puberty yet, right? So when you get that increase in sex hormones, that causes you to get taller. And if you're female bodied, your pelvis is going to start to widen to try to make it easier to push out a baby someday, right? And if you're a male-bodied person with testosterone, the bones are also going to get more dense. So male-bodied people tend to have denser bones. Interesting, the effect on the voice. So when I ask people, a lot of times people think that if you're female-bodied, your voice goes up at puberty, and if you're male-bodied, your voice goes down. Actually, in everybody, the pitch of your voice goes down slightly. And that is how we know, if we hear a voice, if it is a child's voice. Children have a very high-pitched voice. I can't even do it, right? But it's, right? So all of us, that our voice pitch comes down as we become more mature, right? Um, but it goes, it's much more pronounced in male-bodied people. Fat deposition will increase, especially in female-bodied people, and especially in certain hormonally responsive areas, right? So the hips the buttocks, the breasts, right? And interestingly, with testosterone, it causes an increase in fat deposition, then followed by a decrease. So it's very common in early puberty in male-bodied people that they'll get a little pudgy, and then they slim down as they kind of hit their growth spurt. It's very common. Breast development, that is estrogen. So we don't typically see that in male-bodied people. Muscles change if you have testosterone, right? So my son is 14 going on 15, and he loves to lord his testosterone over us all the time because now he can beat us in arm wrestling contests, which he did not used to be able to do, right? And then, of course, the genitals are going to significantly change. They're going to enlarge and mature, right, of the external genitalia as well as the internal structure. So all kinds of magic happens at puberty once the hypothalamus turns up that dial says, let's get to work, secretes GnRH, the pituitary then secretes LH and FSH, which tells the gonads to make gametes and sex cells.
And so this is what I just said in a visual form, right? So the hypothalamus will make GnRH, which tells the pituitary to make LH and FSH, and they will travel through the bloodstream down to the gonads, where LH tells them to make their sex hormone, and FSH will tell them to make their gametes. Mm -hmm. Pretty cool. All right. Now, the new thing that I'm going to tell you about this is that this is also a negative feedback system, similar to the thyroid hormone system. Ooh, look at that. Okay. So let's think about that then and how that translates into some things that you might have some knowledge about. So the way it works normally is once there's enough hormone around, then the hypothalamus will stop making GnRH, so the pituitary stops making LH and FSH, and the gonads will take a break, right? Then hormone levels will drift down a little bit, and so then the hypothalamus will st start making GnRH, and the pituitary will make LH and FSH until the gonads to get back to work, and sex hormone levels will come up a little bit. And we'll just kind of go like this, right? And keep things within a very narrow range. That is how the male reproductive system works. Female reproductive system is a little bit more complicated because we've got the menstrual cycle. It's a whole different ball of wax, right? But, then, but there is still this negative feedback system absolutely in the male-bodied folks, and it does engage in female-bodied people. So if you think about birth control pills, especially the early birth control pills, which were a pretty significant dose of estrogen and progesterone. So, if I start taking extra estrogen and progesterone, what happens to my blood levels of those hormones? Yeah, it's going to go up. So what's my hypothalamus going to do? <sighs> right? Fake. So it's going to stop making GnRH. Pituitary stops making LH and FSH. And then my ovaries are going to go, okay, we're going on vacation. And they're going to take a nap. Right? So the initial birth control pills worked be a negative feedback mechanism, right? You give the body enough exogenous from outside hormone, then the hypothalamus shuts everything down. And so the gonads not only don't make their own sex hormone, they also don't make gametes, right? So that's a way to prevent the ovaries from producing egg cells. Brilliant. Gregory Pincus in a lab in Massachusetts figured this out with rabbits. Very fascinating story. Okay, similarly, guys who are weightlifters or baseball players who are using anabolic steroids. So anabolic means promotes growth and building. Steroid refers to that chemical molecule. These are hormones that produce or that promote muscle building, right? That's why they take them. So what's interesting about them is that they are chemical cousins of testosterone. Testosterone also is an anabolic steroid, right? And so because they are chemical cousins of testosterone, the hypothalamus doesn't really know the difference. So if you have a male-bodied person, or any person actually, who's giving themselves anabolic steroids, their hypothalamus will stop making GnRH, and their pituitary will stop making LH and FSH, and their gonads will take a nap. <laughs> so what can happen in somebody who's using anabolic steroids is their sperm count just drops, right? Because their gonads are on break, right? They've been laid off temporarily. This is also why, and this is super cool, this is also why we can do hormonal treatment for people who are transgender. So if I have someone who's born with a female body, but their brain is male, and they say, I'm a guy, I'm stuck in this body, no problem. I give, I mean, not no problem, right? It's very difficult, right? But from a medical standpoint, I can give them testosterone. So not only will that testosterone cause all of those secondary sex characteristics that we talked about in that table, but it will also, through negative feedback, have their hypothalamus stop making GnRH, their pituitary stops making LH and FSH, and their ovaries, in this case, will shut down. And so they'll stop making eggs, and they'll stop having periods. 
Right? I can also do it the other way. I can take a male-bodied person and give them estrogen and do the same thing. Because the hypothalamus, interestingly, doesn't care which sex hormone it is. It's just like, I just want one. Just give me estrogen, give me progesterone, I don't care. As long as it sees one at sufficient levels, then it's good. Okay. Pretty interesting stuff. Okay. So, most of the time, right, when we want to maintain homeostasis, we use negative feedback. But some things are positive feedback. Is this GIF not working? Is it positive feedback for sneezing? I don't know. I don't think so. I think it's a reflex. And it's mediated through the medulla oblongata for extra fun, because that's like the best part of the brain, because it keeps you alive. All right. <laughs> so childbirth is actually a positive feedback mechanism. And you don't know the parts yet, so I'm just going to show you a few things. All right. So here is a pregnant uterus with a baby inside. This opening at the bottom of the uterus is called the cervix. And this right here is the vaginal canal. That's the vagina, right? Big old baby's going to have to squeeze through there, right? <laughs> so what happens later in pregnancy is the baby's head is pressing on the cervix. And it gets to a point where all of a sudden there's enough pressure on the cervix that it sends a signal up to the hypothalamus. And the hypothalamus then triggers secretion of a hormone called oxytocin. So the hypothalamus is going to tell the pituitary gland to secrete oxytocin. Now oxytocin then travels through the bloodstream, arrives at the uterus, which has receptors for oxytocin. When the uterus sees oxytocin, it's going to contract and push down on that baby. And when the uterus contracts and push down on the baby, you're going to get more pressure of the baby's head on the cervix. So you get more signals up to the hypothalamus. Hypothalamus sends more signals to the pituitary. You make more oxytocin, which tells the uterus to push down again. <laughs> you get more pressure, the baby's head on the cervix, more signals to the hypothalamus, more release of oxytocin, more uterine contractions. And so this is what causes labor. And so you get this pattern of increasing force and frequency of uterine contractions it builds and builds and builds with the ultimate goal of using this baby's head as a dilating wedge to open up the cervix. So that is the whole purpose of labor. That is the whole purpose of uterine contractions is to actually, so if this is my, I'm the baby, <laughs> right? This is the cervix and I'll make it like this. Right? And then that pressure of the baby's head on the cervix will eventually open it up with uterine contractions. Right? And then once the cervix is out of the way, then the woman can push. But not till that happens. You can't push a baby out through a closed cervix. So the whole purpose of labor, the first stage of birth, is repeated uterine contractions in a positive feedback loop through the hypothalamus pituitary oxytocin causing stronger uterine contractions, more pressure of the baby's head on the cervix, more, you know, builds, 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 until finally, right, we break the status quo. So positive feedback we use when we do not want to maintain the status quo anymore, right? We want to get that baby out because it's getting too big. That's what happens in humans anyway. Got to get it out before it gets stuck. So birth is a positive feedback mechanism right? So very different from trying to maintain something within a narrow range. Yeah, I think it's pretty much, for the most part, it's just the reproductive system that uses positive feedback mechanisms. Everything else in our body is all about homeostasis. Yeah? Questions? Talk about that in a second, yeah. Yes, so that's part of the reason why it's bad if the baby is the other way around and it's the baby's butt on the cervix because the baby's bottom is not as effective at dilating and opening up the cervix. So one is that, is that. 
The other is that then if the baby is born bottom first, we have the problem with the fact that the head, which is the biggest part of the baby, is the last part to come out. So in this day and age, if a woman is pushing and pushing and pushing, and the baby isn't coming out because the head is too big for her pelvis, we can do a C-section, right? We can go to surgery and just cut open her belly and take the baby out. But if the baby is butt first, the rest of the baby might come out just fine, but the biggest part is left in there. And also, instead of now being this way, you're this way, and the chin can get stuck behind the pubic symphysis here. So it's very tricky to deliver a breech baby, which is what it's called. Yeah, good question. So most OBGYNs will say, no, we're just gonna do a C-section instead. But some will say, oh, we'll try it. <laughs> so the question is, is there a restriction on how many C-sections you can have? Yes, in effect. Um, anytime we do a C-section, we are cutting open the woman's uterus to get the baby out. Anytime you have surgery on a part of your body, and we sew it back together, but then there's scar tissue. And if you have scars anywhere else on your body, you know that scar tissue does not behave exactly the same as regular body tissues. And in the case of the uterus, that scar tissue is often not quite as strong as the uterus was. And so what can happen if you've had multiple C-sections over time is that during that process of uterine contraction, so if you're trying to have a typical vaginal birth, the uterus can rupture, right? It can, yeah, and that's a, an a emergency, right? life-threatening emergency for mom and baby. So usually you can only have, yeah, they don't want you to have more than three. <laughs> Other questions? All right, so this is all I have for you today. I want you to listen up. I want to tell you two things. One, there is no quiz this week. Happy Thanksgiving, okay? But this material will be on next week's quiz, so don't totally forget it. <laughs> two, watch for either a invitation or a link or something for teams because <laughs> that's how we're going to be doing this class going forward um, so I'm learning how to do it tomorrow should be very exciting <laughs> all right stay well stay safe please do not kiss your grandmothers <laughs> all right happy Thanksgiving <laughs>